Welcome to The F Word, a podcast series that examines, excavates, unpicks and reframes forgiveness through the lives of others. I'm Marina Cantacasino, a journalist from London, founder of the Forgiveness Project charity, and I've built my career investigating how those who face the most complex and devastating things in life find a way through. Each episode, I'll be talking to a guest who's experienced something very difficult or traumatic in their life, but who rather than respond with hate or bitterness, has embraced, or at the very least considered, forgiveness as a response to pain. My guests today have completely separate but similar and very difficult stories in that they are both victims of child sexual abuse. Jeff Thompson is a 60-year-old BAFTA-winning writer, filmmaker, prolific author, spiritual teacher, and martial artist. And Andrea Martinez is an actress, talk show host, and a young mother. The connection comes through having had a profound conversation a few years ago, when Jeff was able to offer support to Andrea, who at the age of 16 was struggling with the abuse that had happened to her. They've met and worked together since when Jeff wrote a screenplay specifically for Andrea. And Jeff's also written a play called Fragile about his own personal experience, as well as a more recent memoir called Notes from the Factory Floor. Oh, hello, Jeff, and hello, Andrea. It's wonderful to have you both join me today for a conversation. Um, Before we start, I just wondered where you're both speaking to me from. From London today. I'm from Stratford-upon-Avon. Well, that's great. You're both so welcome. Now, I know this conversation is going to be difficult for some people, but I also think it's an important conversation to have, and I hope it'll also be helpful and, and even encouraging. So if it's okay with you, I want to dive right in and ask um, what it was that brought you together. Can I perhaps start with you, Andrea, and ask how it was at the age of 16 that you reached out to Jeff to help you find a way through? Or, well, maybe it was the other way around. Maybe it was Jeff who reached out to you. Yeah, so what it was, I experienced sexual abuse at a very young age, so when I was about seven, and then that had quite a big impact as I got older. I went through a lot of depression, and when I was age 16, it was kind of going on for a few months, and like nothing was helping. So I remember my mum, she got therapy for me, I was going for counselling, hypnotherapy, just a lot of different things, and nothing seemed to be getting to the root of the problem or making anything better. And Jeff, he was actually quite a good friend of my stepdad, Paul. And he knew he'd kind of gone through something similar. And he thought, oh, well, maybe if we get Andrea to talk to Jeff, then she might get something from it. So one day he came round and we had a really deep conversation about it. And Jeff said something to me that was really important. But then I remember he was like, it's unfortunate we have to go through these things, but it makes us special because with this that we have we're able to help other people with it or we can use it in various artistic ways and then I remember him asking me if I was interested in any arts if I had any talents and then that's when acting came back into mind for me because I always wanted to do acting as a kid but when I moved to England there was quite a big language barrier for me to pursue acting So I forgot about it for a long time. And then it wasn't until we had that conversation that I then really thought to really push for it and really go for it because with acting, it can be very healing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Andrea. Um, Jeff, can I come to you now and ask how it was that over the course of the years, you developed enough resilience after your own terrible experience of abuse to be able to not only offer Andrea support, but also many others by sharing your story of repair and rejuvenation so publicly. So basically, what was it that enabled you to get to this place where you had enough resources to reach out to help others? Yeah, I'm very similar to Andrea. I was abused when I was young. There's more the grooming and the gaslighting that affected me. That's what created the problems for me afterwards, not so much the abuse, but the confusion afterwards, the self-blame, thinking it was my fault, thinking that somehow I led him on. And that's obviously part of the grooming. And it took me a long time to unpick that. I too suffered with a lot of depression, 
I had this kind of innate need to be creative, but I think this parasite inside me that this guy had implanted, this negative cognition, this abuse, so uh, this inner dialogue always told me I wasn't good enough to be creative. Don't get above your station. Who do you think you are? I would be battered by internal monologues that were kind of almost set up to defend this negative parasite that was in me. So I suffered with a lot of depression. I was very aspirational. I would want to sit down, but then nothing would come out. And then I would talk to other people. And they would basically mirror my inner voice. Who do you think you are? You know. So this created a lot of depressions. There was a lot of self-abuse going on at the time, which I wouldn't have recognized at the time as self-abuse. Physically hurting myself, sexually hurting myself. These are things that I've spent a long time exploring so that I could talk about it and clean it. But they were going on in the background of my life and nobody knew about them, only me. So, of course, these things were going on and they were also creating dissonance. They were also creating self-hatred, self-disgust, you know. So the depressions got worse and worse. And then in the middle of one particularly bad depression, I connected with something much higher. I felt this rage rise up, this anger. And I thought, well, I've got a wife, I've got children. I'm not going to live my life under the dominion of this fear. I didn't even understand where the fear was coming from, so I had no idea what it was. But I had this instinct to sit down and write down everything I was afraid of with the idea that if I could clear all the things I was afraid of, I could live my life in peace and be creative. And that's when I started to discover that this anger, this rage, this dissonance, this deep self-loathing, could be used as a fuel. It could be cleaned. I could channel it and put it into a training session, into a piece of writing, you know, into a piece of theatre. I could put it into a conversation. It could be cleaned. So I started that process of, I suppose you would call it individuation from the Jungian philosophy, the idea that you're bringing up what's in the unconscious and presenting it to the conscious mind. So I just want to add something here because Jung's concept of individuation is really interesting, but it's also pretty complex. Individuation is the journey towards understanding ourselves. And I suppose at its highest level, it's the art of personal transformation, which may of course happen whether we want it to or not, in that life itself pushes us to grow. But the process of individuation benefits most from approaching life like a quest which is exactly, it seems, what Jeff was trying to do, first through martial arts and then through writing. And I was doing that, first of all, through physical training, which gave me some out there, but it didn't touch the depths. It's when I started the creative work, like the writing, that's when I really started to get at it. And eventually I was able to go through all of the usual things, you know, like I blamed my mom, I blamed my dad, for not protecting me. I blamed the police for not putting this guy in prison. I blamed him and I blamed everybody. But once I started to write about it and started to really go into the depths of it, I realized that I had to go beyond blame and I needed to clear it out. There's a lovely saying in the Kabbalah. It says, if you would forgive somebody, first injure them. What it means is before we forgive them or give them over to reciprocity, we have to first injure them. In other words, we have to destroy their story. You have to go in and go, yeah, I wasn't complicit in this. I was a child. Yes, this wasn't my fault. I was a child. As I say in my play, I was 11. I was 11. I was 11. I was fucking 11. Excuse my language. But that's what the character said in the play. The dissonance is I was only 11. I can't be to blame. So I injured my parasite by destroying the story, by destroying the grooming by destroying the gaslighting and saying, I can take responsibility for what's happened in my life since then to a degree and clean it, but I won't take responsibility for what somebody else did to me. But by the same count, I won't hold hate and I won't hold anger and I won't hold rage and I won't hold the need to seek revenge because that just entangles me within more. So, so did that mean that whereas before you'd been somehow inextricably linked and bound to your abuser, now you could somehow release him or be reconciled with what happened? Yeah, absolutely. What I can do is recognise that there is a law of compensation and I can give him over to that. And over a long period of time, that's what I discovered. But the outlet and the discovery and the revelation came through me being brutally honest. You talk about how I was able to reconcile with this. 
I recognised that unless I was literally a pin in a crab shell, pulling out the last remnants of this, it was always going to be a piece of it remained. So I not only got rid of it or exercised it, I actually cleaned it. You could say I laundered it. I brought yeah. this energy up and I cleaned it and I've made it into something beautiful. My plays, my yes. books. So when I came to meet Andrea, I had an idea that if she had a creative outlet, that would take her on the journey to healing because I've been in a similar situation to her. She was able to hear that. And you actually used the word beautiful with Andrea, didn't you? You sort of told her that she could create something beautiful by using her creativity as part of her process of healing. Yeah, absolutely. Because this energy that's inside you, I call it parasitical, because it's like when somebody abuses you, you become entangled with them. So even if you're separated by time and distance and by years and years, they're still in you and you're still in them. So they are still abusing you, even in their absence, because they enter your mind, they take over mm -hmm. your mind. So I recognise that I needed to take myself back to that pure place. What happened when this guy abused me was he stole something of mine, an innocence, a part of the soul, whatever you want to call it. And the only way I was going to get it back was to forgive him, to give him over. I wouldn't get yes. it back with revenge and anger. If I was able to take that innocence back that he'd stolen, I'd be able to give him back the parasite that he'd given to me. Thank you for that, Jeff. I think what you've given there is a really detailed and insightful description of how someone can shed or alleviate the effects of trauma by facing, you know, facing absolutely head on the reality of, of every detail of what happened. Um, and you mentioned forgiveness, and I definitely want to come back to that in a minute. But first of all, Andrea, can I come back to you? I know that Jeff's abuser was an adult in authority who he admired and even loved. And was there a similar kind of betrayal for you, Andrea? Perhaps you can talk just a little bit about what happens to someone when that kind of trust is, is eroded. For me, in my case, it was someone in the family. So it was a family member. And it was someone that I kind of looked up to as a father figure because my dad wasn't really present when I was younger. And he looked after me sometimes, but not enough. And especially through that time where I was living in that house, my dad wasn't there. So I kind of looked up to this person as a father figure, really trusted them. So when they did what they did, it was really confusing. And it was just like a really big feeling of betrayal, especially because it wasn't something that just happened once. It was an ongoing thing for, I think, about two years. I can't remember the first and last time because it happened so many times. And it was, like Jeff said, you do feel guilty for it. Sometimes you do feel like, oh, did I lead that person on? Was it my fault? Was it this? Even when I went on to telling my mom a few years later and we confronted them and stuff, he completely denied it. So even that, I started to even question myself. I started to think, oh, did I imagine that? Did that actually happen? That's how crazy it is because you don't want to believe that actually happens. And also shame is a great silencer, isn't it? And I would think, Jeff, in that space of not telling anyone, you can imagine just about anything. Your mind can run riot. Exactly what she said, Andrea articulated it beautifully. It makes you doubt the facts yourself. It makes you doubt it. And you have to really break that down. That's part of the grooming. You have to break that down and go, no matter what happens, I was a child and this happened. Exactly. And I'm going to confront it. That's how we break it. But it's less about the shame. That's a big part of it. But it's more about the fact that society and the people around you make you think it didn't happen or maybe you did lead him on or maybe yes. it was your fault. But you have to come back to the point. I was a child. No matter what happened, it can never be my fault. Yeah, yes. exactly. And I think I kept it quiet for quite a few years. Didn't actually tell my mum until I was about 11. So there was a few years I didn't tell anyone. I just kept it secret because where I was so young, I didn't really understand it. So I think it was only when I got older, I started to, I don't know, you see certain films and stuff and you start to think, oh, wait a minute, something similar happened to me. Maybe what happened to me wasn't right. And then that's what made me tell my mum. But for a few years, yeah, I literally didn't tell anyone. And it haunted me growing up. OK, I think this is a good place to talk about forgiveness. It seems to have come into the conversation very quickly. And I know it's a big part of both of your recovery process. 
Uh, it's also a really difficult subject to talk about in this context. I remember doing um, a BBC interview a few years ago um, to comment on a survey they'd done for local radio about what people um, could and couldn't forgive. And it was on a score of like one to 10. And they found child abuse was considered more unforgivable than murder. And, and I don't think this is unsurprising because, because when adults prey on vulnerable children for their own gain in a, in a cold and calculated way, it's far more difficult to understand than, than say, murder, which is maybe seen as hot-blooded or a moment of madness or, or coming from vengeful instincts, which, you know, we all have at times. So l let's just talk about how you came to forgive uh, both of you and how you also came to talk about it publicly, Jeff. But, Andrew, can I come to you first? Um, when you met when you were 16, did Jeff actually talk about forgiveness then? I think so, yeah. I remember throughout that time when I was 17, 16, there was no way I was going to forgive this person. And I remember feeling like I didn't really understand how am I supposed to forgive this person after what they did, after what they took from me. Like now I feel like this. And it wasn't just depression. It was more than that. I even went through self-harm, a lot of different things. So for a few years, I didn't even understand how I'd be able to forgive them until one day it just clicked. One day it just clicked for me that if I forgive this person and then I no longer have to feel bad all the time, it's that I'm able to just free myself from them. And I remember when that moment came, I even wanted to speak to him. I kind of just wanted to have a conversation just to let them know how I felt and everything. And I don't know, just for my own sake, for closure, I don't know. But that never happened because as I kept telling myself, okay, I'm going to message them on Facebook or whatever and speak to them, they were then murdered, which was really strange because no matter what he had done, never in a million years did I wish murder upon anyone or death upon anyone. So I felt really strange. I did feel really sad that that had happened to them also in the way that it happens. It was a very sensitive situation because he was a family member in my family back home in Venezuela. A lot of family members, when I gave my condolences and stuff, they were a bit funny because they said, oh, well, this is what you would have wanted anyway. They took it as I was being fake. And I was like, no way, not in a million years did I want this person to be dead. So, yeah, that kind of conversation I wanted to have with them never happened. And, yeah, it was just left like that. So, so it's a freeing for yourself, Andrea. Yeah, definitely is. You feel like by forgiving, you may be weaker, but it's the complete opposite. When you're able to forgive, it just gives you a lot of strength within yourself. Yes, yes, absolutely. And you've also said it's a process, haven't you? Yeah, it's definitely a process. It, does, it took a few years and it was a process. It was just kind of thinking about it, thinking I should do this, I should do that. And it was just one day it just clicked. I don't even know how it was. It was just always telling myself, okay, eventually I need to forgive this person to be able to free myself. One day I was just ready to do it and I just forgave them completely. I saw them kind of like, they done this, but I don't know if they went through the same thing as a child. So I started to look at them differently instead of as this person that betrayed me. I started looking at them as a human being, not knowing what they've been through. I was able yeah. to forgive very powerful isn't it because what Andrea's used there is she's defeated him with compassion she's found compassion mm -hmm. rather than yes. being stuck in that line of fear and dissonance he's looked and thought which is true that everybody is a victim of something it doesn't condone what they do but everybody's a victim mm -hmm. of something and unless we're omniscient we can't know exactly what but we can free ourselves by letting them go and is that what happened to you Jeff and did that help much later when you came to confront your abuser yeah, I mean, I built myself up into a monster. I built myself up into this world-class martial artist, this fighter. But then when I started to tip into the higher end of martial arts, the Budo, I started to look at the real power, the power to forgive, the power to expand awareness like Andrea did there. She expanded her awareness and she saw things from different angles. And you did have a conversation, didn't you, once? I think in McDonald's where you bumped into your abuser one day, you know, years after the incident. 
I did, yeah. One day I just found myself confronted with this guy. I was obviously ready to forgive him. And I realised as soon as I saw him, I knew innately that if I was physical with him in any way, I would entangle myself more. I would create more reciprocity for myself. And whatever was in him would be fed by my rage. And whatever was in me would be fed by it. I was given the chance to have a conversation. And it was a powerful conversation because I'd built this carapace this armory around this very wounded, insecure child. And when I saw him again, that child was evident. That 11-year-old was evident. Mm. So climbing out of that McDonald's chair was like climbing out of a dugout and going across no man's land. It felt like life and death to me, but I knew that if I walked away, I would lose a vital opportunity. So I stood in front of him. I completely disfigured myself. And again, I didn't realize this until many years later. I was a pretty boy. I was very androgynous. And I put myself into a place where I got broken nose, cauliflower ears. I was very heavy. I was 16 stones. So I kind of disfigured myself unconsciously to get rid of all the prettiness. And I said, you won't recognize me, but you abuse me and you need to know what I give you. And I told him it twice. I had to really affirm it once for him and once for me. This is yes. what I'm doing. I watched him dissolve in front of me. I watched his power dissipate. But similar to Andrea, before I was able to forgive him, I had to injure him. I had to get more information. I needed a wider perspective. When I watched him deflate as I forgave him, and he put his hand out because he wanted to shake my hand, I realised that he was already defeated and that at some subliminal level, he was accepting my decision to give him back to reciprocity. And also, I think I mentioned to you before, Marina, once that I walked away from this situation feeling quite proud of myself because it was a difficult thing to do. But quickly afterwards, I realized there was a quiet conceit there. Man, I had done so many things wrong in the world. I'd hurt so many people. I'd physically damaged so many people. I'd been unkind and cruel to so many people. And I had a lot of work to do, my own repentance. And when I say repentance, I mean in the sense of repair. I'm still working on it now. So when you forgave him, it was like your opportunity to go away and heal. And his opportunity, yes. if he wanted to, to go away and repent. That didn't happen with him. In similar to Andrea's case, he wasn't murdered, but he committed suicide. And that quite often happens when people are confronted with what's happened to them. In quantum physics, they talk about entanglement, and they say that entangled parties can't be differentiated. The best way to completely disentangle is to go right the way through it, to go right the way into it, and then you can break free from it. And once you recognize that, you're able to let them go by giving them over to a law of compensation. So at some level, although Andrea never had the conversation with her abuser, at some level, that conversation or that commitment to forgive was registered somewhere. Yeah. Reciprocity unfolded very quickly. So reciprocity, I imagine, has some sort of reward in a way for moving towards reconciling and repairing and showing compassion. But Jeff, I just wanted to also ask, you know, where, where does forgiveness fit into all this? You mentioned yeah. earlier on, Marina, that people talk about forgiveness and the one thing they don't want to forgive is child abuse. And I believe that's because people don't understand what forgiveness is. The mm. bigger the sin, the more we need to forgive. In other words, the more damaging the sin, the more we have to give them back to the law of compensation, to karma, to reciprocity, whatever you want to call it. And you only have to take a basic look at science to see that what goes around comes around, what goes out comes back. This is where the level of inquiry is. We have to go into that. We have to recognize that we're not letting somebody off. The crime, in a sense, doesn't really matter. I want to share here just a glimpse into one of the other stories we work with at the Forgiveness Project, which addresses this same subject in relation to forgiveness and child sexual abuse, and actually in a remarkably similar way. Dave Deneen was from Ireland and a victim of multiple perpetrators throughout his childhood. And he said there were two ways of looking at the situation, one which would lead to despair and darkness, and the other to light and peace of mind. And he says this, he says, I took the road of light. It was an instant decision, a moment of opportunity and grace. I've been down so deep in the darkness, pain, rage, self-medication and addiction, that I had to find a way out. For me, forgiveness was like an escalator into the light. So I took that chance. And, and then I went on to remind Jeff about something he'd once said. 
I just want to remind you of something you said, Jeff, once, which I found incredibly powerful. And I wonder if you could speak to that. It was post the Jimmy Savile scandal. And you said that, you know, people are understandably suspicious, even angry, if someone talks about forgiveness in connection with paedophilia or child sexual abuse, because they think automatically that you're condoning the action or leaving the way open for further abuse. And you said that when people attack people like you for forgiving their abusers, it's unkind and the subtext is loaded with judgment and implication. And then you said, and I want to quote you directly here, you said, this is the dangerous naivety and presumption of the observer who sees only two options in sex-related abuse, a day in court or a violent revenge. Forgiveness is not even in their lexicon. They fail to see its potency. And then you went on to say, when you have tried and been failed by the judiciary and bloodlust turns you into a monster, what are you left with? That was my experience of displacing my anger and my dissonance and trying to fix the world outside, having this feeling I've got to defend myself against everybody and I've got to defend everybody else. But the more violent I was, the worse it got. It was like the head of Hydra. Every time I cut one off, another one grew in its place. So I also had my moment in a police station where I sat with a policeman. The policeman basically said to me, listen, unless we catch these people in the act, we're pretty much lost. We can't do nothing. He seemed naive himself. He seemed more interested in whether I'd enjoyed it or not. And it made me feel very angry and violent towards yeah. him. So I felt patronised. Mm. I felt blamed. And again, I was in a highly sensitive state. So you didn't have to say much for me to think you were against me, you know. But this particular person was still working around children. It was still a danger, but they couldn't do nothing. My testimony didn't help. People presume you haven't explored those options, but those options didn't work for me. You know, I could take somebody to court and I could go through that process. And that may be a vital part of my process. That can be very important. Yeah. But it doesn't mean I get the parasite out of me. If I can't at some level find a compassion, an ability to completely exercise them from me, whether they're in court, or whether they're killed or whether they die, they're still in me. I'm still entangled. I know Andrea completely entangled herself in creativity and art, which is what I did. But all the other stuff won't remove the parasite if you don't find true forgiveness. And true forgiveness is true power. But to do that, we have to, we have to try and understand reciprocity. The problem isn't with forgiveness. The problem is with the misunderstanding of what forgiveness is. Once you've forgiven properly, you will know because you will feel compassion. It doesn't yeah. condone what people yeah. do. It doesn't mean they shouldn't go to prison. It doesn't mean they shouldn't go to court. But we can free ourselves by educating ourselves, not just looking at those two options. And that's the line of inquiry it took me down. It was a really profound moment when I just got to the point where I thought, I don't need to be concerned about what other people are doing wrong or what they've done wrong. I need to be concerned with what I've done wrong and what I'm still doing wrong. I can do something about that, you know. That's what excites me anyway. I can make changes in the world by making changes in myself. Andrea, have, have you had any pushback for talking about forgiveness in this context? Or have people largely been very respectful? No, very respectful, really. I haven't spoken about it too much. There was a point where I did used to blame a lot. I would kind of blame my dad a lot because he didn't believe me when I said it. And he was one of the people that said, oh, well, are you sure you didn't lead him on? And I found that so betraying. Like when people ask you something like that, it just makes you feel even worse. And there was even a time when I went back home, the abuser, he was actually at a dinner party. I remember saying to my dad, no, I don't want to go there because I felt uncomfortable. And I literally remember being forced to go there and just be in front of this person and act like nothing's yeah. happened because no one else knew and a lot of family members didn't believe me as well. So it was really uncomfortable. So I also developed a lot of negative feelings to a lot of other members in my family for not believing me. It wasn't just forgiving my abuser, it was also forgiving my dad for not, not even doing anything because that was another big thing for me. And it was difficult because of the fact that he was a family member. It wasn't a thing where, oh, okay, I want him to go to prison because I didn't want anyone's life affected by this per se. But in the end, I just had to forgive not just my abuser, like a lot of other people in the family as well. I call that secondary abuse, Marina. 
had a lot of people write to me over the years. It was rarely the abuse that affected them. It was always the denial of the family. And of yeah. course, the family always deny because of fear, because yes. they don't want the shame. They don't want the disturbance. And someone said to me, you didn't lead him on, did you? And they're the same thing. You're thinking, how can I lead someone on? I'm a child. That's a loaded question. It's basically saying, I think it was your fault. There's a lot of fear and ignorance around it. I had to forgive all of the people and all of their ignorance because they didn't know what they were saying. They didn't understand it. I had to expand my own consciousness, my own awareness, so that I could also take into consideration their ignorance. Some people have said, you've let him off and you've left him to do it again. I'd have just killed him dead. Yeah. That's the first thing people react with because they just haven't done the inquiry. Yeah. Societal gaslighting yeah. then. Yeah. Everybody's afraid. I was met with stillness with coldness, with fear. It was like I dropped a bomb in my mum's Sunday afternoon kitchen. I loved them. They just didn't know how to react. They had no idea how to process this. Because what was it that your mother would say to you as a child, Jeff? Never bring shame to my door. We were more afraid of shame than an assassin's bullet. Absolutely terrified of shame. And when you spoke to Andrea when she was 16, did you warn her about how society reacts to victims of abuse? Um, basically, what I said to Andrea was, this is a fantastic opportunity for you to take this energy and process it into something magnificent. Yeah. We can process mm -hmm. it into something great. This is a latent energy. Most people won't look at it. Most people will stay in anger or dissonance and it will become an identity. But I said, you have an ability here to take this energy, process it and create something magnificent with it. And in the process, bring yourself back to some kind of homeostasis. I kind of showed her what I'd done myself. This happened to me. I can't change it. But what am I left with? I'm left with a reservoir of energy that I can do something mm -hmm. with. That was what excited Andrea, because she said she was really interested in acting. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, when you're ready, when you've been through your acting school, I'll write you a film, and then you yeah. can act in that. Yeah, you can star I think in that's it. right. So instead of being entangled in what's happening with the abuse and what happened and all the dissonance, you become entangled in something very positive and something empowering. And I knew I could do that. I wasn't offering something that I didn't think I could do. And some years later, Andrea did call me up and, <laughs> and said, can you do that film for me? And we did a great film, didn't we, Andrea? Yeah, it was amazing. It we was had the so, launch so at good. BAFTA, and she's amazing in it, and you won an award for yeah, it. Yeah, I even got an award for it. Oh, that's brilliant. But do you think we could perhaps finish by talking about the healing power of creativity in the arts? I mean, it's extraordinary. I've spoken to so many people who've suffered from harm or, or atrocity and trauma, and so often they talk about music, writing or performing or painting as having really helped them heal. It seems like a, a, a really effective way of channeling pain in order to transform it or find meaning from it. Yeah, perhaps talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Each film or play enabled me to look at it from a different aspect and come at it from a different place. There's a lovely line I read somewhere where it says, what you bring to light will become a light. He didn't say what you bring to light will become light. He said what you bring to light will become a light. I wrote a film called Romans for Orlando Bloom, and it was very difficult processing it again. But I already know that film has landed around the world and had a massive effect on people who have been abused and encouraged them to talk. It becomes a comfort, but it interrupts someone's life when they're at a very difficult point and they get the message and they see it. And that's why Andrea's acting and what she's going to do and the things she's going to do in the future. This talk is me and Andrea. We're taking that pain, <laughs> that dissonance that people will hopefully listen to and go, that's me. I can do something with that. Yeah. yeah. It kind of gives you a voice to tell your story. With acting, it can be very healing when you really put yourself into that character zone and you dig into different emotions. It creates an allowing for people. It allows mm -hmm. them to tell their story, yeah. especially if somebody tells the story as viscerally as I do. I really go into the detail of my shame and yeah. especially my self-abuse afterwards because I know these are things people are frightened to talk about. And if somebody talks about it, it creates an allowing for somebody else to talk about it. Yeah. And they can go, oh, that's mm -hmm. me. I did that. Well, thank you both for that. And I think perhaps on, on that note, we should draw the conversation to an end. And I want to say a massive thank you to both of you for coming on the F Word podcast 
and for talking to me today. It was just such a pleasure to hear what you both had to say. I think Andrea articulated it beautifully. I think she hit some mm. aspects that I hadn't thought about myself. She's yeah. such a courageous person. I really admire her. Uh, I admire you. Oh, well, that's a perfect way to end, I think. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. And Farina. Thank you for listening to the F Word podcast. To dig a bit deeper around some of the themes we've talked about, do check out the show notes by going to theforgivenessproject.com slash F-word podcast. And from there, you can also explore the Forgiveness Project website, which over the years has collected and shared many more stories of how people have transformed the darkest of situations. I also want to invite you to join the F-word podcast Facebook group, especially if you have more to discuss or share. Again, to find the link, go to theforgivenessproject.com slash F-word podcast. But most of all, I hope you'll join me again. <laughs>